So six months ago, uh, Roger very mentioned there was this conference in Hong Kong um, about Bitcoin Cash. So it was probably one of the first very big, very large conference about Bitcoin Cash. And the whole project was not that old. It was only like two, three months old or something. It was already showing sign of growing big very fast. And I made a talk at this conference uh, about what I would like to see happen in the next few months for, um, you know, for the whole project, right? What kind of, of new stuff we needed to develop to make that work. And today I'm gonna do more or less the same thing, except I had to change almost the whole content because most of the point I mentioned six months ago are actually done. So six months ago I mentioned that we needed a new way to adjust difficulty because the way we had was not stable. This has happened in November. We needed a new address format because people were confused because between Bitcoin Core and Bitcoin Cash addresses. Um, this has happened as well. And I mentioned a few other stuff. Some of them uh, have made good progress as well. So, But before going into that, I would like to... Okay, there is two microphones now. I would like to outline a bit uh, why why Bitcoin Cash? What led me to write Bitcoin ABC, which was the first implementation of Bitcoin Cash, and that eventually led to the fork, and then we were joined by other implementation. Uh, so why do that? And, and the reason is money. And money is this incredible stuff that people use every single day, and nobody has any freaking idea what it is. Um, and it's, it's, it's quite incredible because even if you go to a bank or some trading company or whatever, like people that actually not only use money every day, but it's supposed to be their job to handle money, uh, most of them actually don't know what it is. So money is something that has three characteristics and, and, and three, I'd say three use cases and various characteristics that make it good or bad for those use cases. And those use cases are more or less inseparable. Um, because if you are missing one of the three, or if you do poorly on one of the three, then you have a poor form of money and some bad stuff happen. And we're going to dig into that a bit with what happened to existing form of money. So those three use cases are going to be medium of exchange, meaning I can exchange some money for goods and services with other people. This is a way to transmit value that is uh, convenient, preferably. A unit of account. So a unit of account means that I can use this money as a unit to measure value. So for instance, how much, how much I saved, right? I, I, I worked and I had a salary and I saved some money. Well, you know, how much value do I have created for myself um, is there and I can reuse it later, right? So this is a way to measure or, or you know, what this is the price of value stuff, right? So it's a measure of how valuable those stuff are. So it's a way to measure value, and it's a store of value, preferably, meaning that the value that is represented by that money is going to hold over time. I can trust that if I put some money on the side, I can keep it there for, for maybe 10 years or even more, and I, I need to be able to trust that in that time, when the time comes, because I need to buy something big, maybe I want to buy a house, or maybe I want to start a company, or do something that require more money than usual, I need to trust that I'm going to be able to use that money to do that. And those three characteristics are what makes money. And so, yeah, to, to achieve that, it needs to be easy to transfer money from one people to another. Money needs to be fungible, meaning that one unit of money is the same as one other unit of money. Um, Say, you know, there is something that is scarce, durable, and transferable uh, that would be precious gems, like uh, diamonds, and, you know, rubies, whatever. Uh, those are not fungible. Each one of them is unique. And if you split one in two and you reassemble it, it's going to be much less valuable than what it was to begin with. So it makes a poor form of money. And effectively, nobody used diamonds as a form of money, even though they have all the other characteristics there. Uh, but things like precious metal, gold or silver, for instance, I can split a piece of silver in two, and then I can melt it 
and you know, melt it back to a larger piece of silver, and there is no difference between one piece of silver or another. It has always exactly the same characteristics. Uh, so, so it is fungible and divisible that way. Um, and to remain valuable over time, it needs to be durable, kind of obviously. Um, anything that is perishable is not gonna make a very good form of money. This is probably one of the main reasons why gold has been so much used as a money, because for the longest time in humanity, gold was a metal, so it has the other characteristic, and it doesn't uh, oxidize, right? When um, iron, for instance, is gonna rust at some point, so it's not durable. Uh, no, we know to make you know, a special kind of iron, but we, you know, we are in the modern world, we have a lot of technology, but for most of human history, gold was kind of the only metal that, that you know, was durable that way. And it to be scarce. Um, so you, you cannot produce new unit of money all the time as much as you want. All right, so let's go into the two main forms of money that have been used by human for most of history, and those are gonna be uh, gold and fiat money. Um, so gold has very good, you know, it's, it's very scarce, very durable, uh, very fungible. It's a bit less convenient to divide, right? Like if um, I want to split a gold coin in half, it's not very convenient or to reassemble, uh, but it's doable. Um, and it's not super convenient uh, to use as a transfer of value, medium of exchange. I need to actually transport gold, I need to secure my gold. Uh, I cannot do that over a large distance uh, very quickly. So this is not the most convenient, and this is not very easy to check, you know, how pure it is if I'm receiving gold. So this is not the most convenient, this is okay. Humanity used that a lot, but this is not the best. And so what happened is that people use gold for a while in some societies, and the society grow, um, commerce increase, and those stuff that it doesn't do very well uh, becomes more and more of a burden. So at some point people turn to some authority and the authority is gonna say, okay, I'm gonna emit this fiat money, which is like coins and bills and stuff like that, credit cards, uh, you know, what you probably use all the time, every day. And this authority is gonna say, well, you know, those stuff are very transferable, divisible, and fungible, and they're not scarce or anything. So that authority is gonna say, essentially, you're gonna have to trust me. You're gonna have to trust me, I'm not gonna emit a bazillion of those stuff, it's gonna remain valuable. Um, what happened in practice is that they are trusty, trustworthy for like you know a decade or two, and, and <laughs> then they start the printing press. Um, and so yeah, on average, fiat money is lasts for 27 years in the world, and even the fiat money that have significantly outlasted their life expectancy, such as the dollar, uh, well, the dollar has lost 98 percent of its value since it's been created. So it's alive. Uh, by some value of a life, but um, it's certainly uh, not fresh and young anymore. And so, we have this cycle in human history, right, where a civilization grow, use precious metal, and it's not convenient, they use fiat, the authority that emits fiat become untrustworthy, and the whole civilization collapse into hyperinflation. And if you work, if you, you know, are interested in history, Every single detail changed, but this story is the one of every single great empire, be it like the Roman Empire or the Ottoman Empire, and all of them, they went through the same cycle, like every single one. If you know the history of Monet, you know like the human history, essentially, the civilization history. And almost, uh, almost 10 years ago, in 2009, someone decided to break that cycle, or maybe not just decided, but found a way to do it. Uh, that person, we don't know who that is, called himself uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, and found a technology that was actually doing great on all of those points, right? And this is, this is very, very, very hard to overstate how radically important that is. Uh, that is like literally civilization altering. So that is the kind of information you need to put side by side with you know, the, the printing press or like even the inversion of writing or whatever, right? This is something that you know, we may use every day right now and be excited about it, but this is something that's gonna change human history and, and the story of civilization. 
way after we are dead. But you know, you're not gonna see it, but you can feel good because you're making it happen. All right. So now we've established why we want to do that. And, and so that leads us to Bitcoin Cash, right? Some people in the Bitcoin community decided that actually this civilization changing stuff, it's kind of lame. Uh, we don't like it. What we want is like digital gold because we already have gold, but this one is less convenient because we need to keep computer running all the time too. Um, so that's great. And so we had to do something about it. Um, and this is what happened last year uh, in August, where Bitcoin split in two. And essentially, no, we have two Bitcoin. We have actually much more Bitcoin. <laughs> no, but we have two main branch of Bitcoin that are going to be like Bitcoin BTC or Bitcoin Core, or whatever you want to call it, and Bitcoin Cash. And as far as I'm interested in, this is the interesting one, right? This is the one that, that is a currency um, that is actually, you know, worth, worth changing. So, what did we change? Um, we increased the block size to 8 megabytes. In May, it's going to go to 32. That means that we, uh, that way we restored the good characteristic as a medium of exchange of Bitcoin that were, um, you know, more or less lost when blocks became full. Uh, we fixed quadratic caching, which was uh, some technical bug um, that makes some certain type of transaction very expensive to validate. And we remove a technology that was introduced um, in Bitcoin Core that is called replace by fee or RBF. That is, um, instead of, right now on Bitcoin Cash, when you make a transaction, you can trust even before it is actually mined in the block that it's, it's very likely that you know, it's going to be mined shortly, right? And it's not going to be double spent or anything because the node on the network decide to mine by default the first transaction that they see. And most of them, they're going to see the same one. We have, we, I'm not going to delve into that too much because uh, Tom already did that uh, yesterday. But essentially, um, Bitcoin Core at some point decided to change that and they went they developed this feature called replace by fee, where transactions are not the first one that the network sees that are gonna be mined, but the one that pays the highest fee. And this is uh, obviously completely destroying the usage as a medium of exchange, right? Because um, that means that as long as someone is not, in, and as long as some transaction is not included in a block, then it's worth nothing, essentially. It can change under your feet at any time. All right, so, with that, we went back to the, you know, the Bitcoin that we all loved in the early day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that being said, you know, it's, um, it's not magic. Like, we need to continue. If we want to grow that stuff to something that is worse scale, we need to do more, right? That is enough for the scale we are operating at right now, but we need to do more. So what do we want to do? We want to do UTXO commitment and I'm glad to say that there is Thomas that is in the room uh, here that started working on that. So what are UTXO commitment? Well, right now in Bitcoin, people make transactions and those transactions are included into blocks and you play the whole history of all the block and you can figure out who owns what money. Well, who, what address owns what money. And this is a very long process because you need to replay essentially the whole history of the whole system, you need to replay all the transactions that have ever been made one day on Bitcoin to know who owns what money. And as Bitcoin gets older, and as the people, the number of people using it grow larger, uh, this becomes a more and more and more expensive process. So this technology called UTXO commitment is a way to put in every block, not only the transactions that have just been mined in that block, but a commitment of the whole state of the system, who owned what money, right? And as a result of that, you'll be able to start a new node, get the state of the system from someone that was monitoring it, verify that it actually matches uh, what the miners are doing, and start validating from there. So instead of having 
several hours of processing before your software can do anything on the Bitcoin blockchain, you'll be able to start it and, and in a few minutes um, get where we need to be. So that's a very important feature if we want Bitcoin to grow old without problem and if we want Bitcoin to grow big without problem. All right. The second stuff I think we need to focus on is this concept of pre-consensus. And some people talked about that a bit. Um, uh, Peter, for instance, the weak block is like a, a form of pre-consensus. And uh, to understand why we want to do that, you need to understand what the problem is that we are trying to solve. And actually, there are two problems, even three problems, but they boil down to the same technical issue. And those three problems are going to be, first, the utilization of resources of uh, the machine that makes the network work is extremely inefficient. So it goes a bit um, as follow. For the most part, uh, a node that is connected to the network does nothing, um, or it, it does a few stuff, but it does mostly nothing. And then some miner find a block, and frenetically the nodes start to you know, work as, as like a madman as hard as possible to validate this block as fast as possible. And that goes back to doing mostly nothing. And there is a very important characteristics of the system that we want the red area where the node works frenetically to be small compared to the green area always. If that is not the case, then all kind of perverse incentives start to creep in. And right now, this is actually the, the biggest problem to increase the block size, right? This is like this red area. So if you take computer that you have right now, you, you, you know, go to buy a high, even a high-end laptop, you have enough computing power in there to process gigabyte-sized block. No problem, right? You, we have incredibly powerful computer for very cheap right now. And to give you an idea, gigabyte size block is uh, Visa scale, essentially. So you can process on Bitcoin right now with a, a you know, high-end computer that is not even that expensive, as many transactions as Visa. However, we cannot quite do it that way. Because we would make this red area much larger than it is right now, and we would create a ton of perverse incentive in the system. And so that's a problem because we want to do that. Or at least I, I do, and I think many people in that room want to. I see Peter that is uh, saying yes here. <laughs> and, and I know like Bitcoin Unlimited have been working on the Gigablock testnet, for instance, to um, see what actually are the limitation there. So it's possible to do it right now, but we are not quite in a state where you want to deploy that because it's going to have you know, we had side effects. Uh, the, the two problem, the two other problem are zero confirmation. Right now, if we got to compare to credit card, credit card settled in two to three months typically. Um, whereas we are able to settle a transaction like, you know, in minutes, on average 10 minutes. So on that front, we do much, 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 much better. We don't need a third party to do that. So it's, it's all great. But there is one thing that we don't do as well as credit card, and I think it's quite critical that we get right, is that the credit card is able to tell you within a few seconds yes and no for this transaction with a very high degree of certainty. This degree is like not 100%. You're going to get to 100% in two to three months, but it's 99%. Within a second, it's telling you this is good or this is not good with very high degree of certainty. And... Right now, we are doing very poorly compared to those kind of system. And if we want to be used as cash, we need to improve that. And there is the flip side of that, is that um, the, the positive side is, is uh, double spend, right? You want to say, yes, this is the transaction that is valid. It's not going to be double spent. But also, you want to be able, within a few seconds as well, to say, no, this transaction like, is non-standard or doesn't pay enough fee or whatever. You don't want it to like, be a zombie around in the mempool for two days, people wondering what is going on. Um, like you cannot stay today in a shop, you know, like waiting for the stuff to expire to make a new one. So um, we need also within a few seconds to say, okay, this doesn't fit the policy that the miner are using right now on the network. You need to uh, 
you know, you need to make another transaction. And also that's very important use case, right? Like we want zero conf, we want scaling, so uh, this is what we want. And it's not that easy to get it, actually. So right now the convergence mechanism that we have is proof of work. Uh, however, if, so if we increase the block size, we increase the red zone and we create perverse incentive. But if we make blocks come faster, uh, we not increase the size of the red zone, but we make more red zone in there and um, we end up with the same problem, right? The red zone become non-negligible compared to the green zone. Uh, so what we want to do is that we want to remove work from the red zone and move it away to the green area. So there is as little work as possible in the red zone. So essentially you want nodes to be talking to each other during the 10 minutes and prepare everything that needs to be prepared. And when a block is found, it's like, okay, well I expected that I remove like this transaction and this one at these two ones done, you know? Um, so that way the red zone is very small even if the whole system process a ton of transaction. And so there are various, well, yeah, okay. This is essentially why I explained. Um, we want to converge, yeah, we want to converge, um, you know, quite quickly before a block is found. And ideally we want to do that, so, you know, it helps bigger blocks, it helps uh, all kind of stuff. But the important stuff is that we want to do it, ideally it's less than three seconds, and if it's more than five seconds, it's actually not gonna quite work. And, and we gotta be realistic here, this is the, the constraint we are facing. If we want, if we want to, Take market where credit card are used, for instance. Like this is the number we need to be looking at. And putting stuff down to like, you know, 20 or 30 seconds, it's better than what we have right now. And if we know to do that, why not? But we need to understand that it's an optimization stuff. If we can get it to this kind of number, this is not an optimization anymore. This is enabling new use cases, right? This is opening new markets for us. So, if we aim for that, what, what can we conclude? Well, there is essentially three methods to converge, but there is one that uh, I think don't quite work to get those numbers, and uh, I'm sorry, Peter, but uh, it's gonna be proof of work. Like, proof of work, and um, we saw the number in your presentation, you get to 20, 30 seconds, which is much better than what we have right now, but I think it's not quite enough uh, to get to those three to five seconds because you need to propagate the block, and you need to verify them, and it just takes too long. You also don't find them that often, or you find a bazillion of them, but then you, know, you spend all your time sending them around. So it doesn't quite work. So there are two other options that are used within the space, or two categories of solution, I, I would say, because those are not actual solution. There are many variations of those ID, but the first one is gonna be you elect a leader, and when there is some confusion in the system, the leader is gonna say this or that. And this is what uh, Emin presented uh, yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, with Bitcoin NG. So Bitcoin NG used the mining process not only to confirm transaction, but also to elect a leader that is gonna be able to decide what's going on for, you know, until the next leader is elected. So this is one way to do it. Um, the drawbacks is that if the leader uh, is malicious or if the leader is attacked or whatever, then you know, like until the next leader is found, uh, we are uh, maybe not insecure, but you know, we don't have like all the goodies that we would like to have. But otherwise, this is something that, that works great. And the other categories of solution, it's gonna be you select a quorum of other actor in the space and you look at what they do, yes? Okay. And you look at what they do and they're gonna do rounds of voting and via this run of voting and some algorithm, they're gonna agree on you know, a, a set of events that they agree on happened. And so those two systems, electing a leader and listening to a quorum, come with a different set of trade-offs but are able to converge within the, the kind of uh, time frame we are looking at. So I would like to explore what, what we can do in that area. So the goal we must fix to ourselves is like 99% confidence within three seconds. I think this is what we should be aiming for. And that puts us, you know, further, uh, that's, that, that, that makes us better than credit cards essentially, which is what we want, right? You don't want to be just as good, you want to be better because people, there is a cost associated to switching. So if you're as good, then 
people have no incentive to switch. So that way we are cheaper than credit card, we settle as fast with high degree of certainty, we settle much faster with a 100% certainty. So if we can make that happen, we are better than credit card. Uh, and, and the last stuff, and I'm not gonna, um, I think it's the last stuff, open to question. Uh, <laughs> it's transaction ordering, I'm gonna go quickly on that one because um, um, it's, it's been presented as well yesterday. But if we decide instead of ordering transaction the way we are doing right now to choose a canonical ordering, then we have all kind of goodies that follow of that. It's not that big of a change. Um, so what we can do with that is like various kind of, of proof that something fishy is going on on the network because you can prove that something is not on the block anymore. You can really block around much faster because you don't need to specify in what order the transaction are in. Uh, anybody on the network can just you know, get the set of transaction and reconstruct the block the same way you would have built it. Uh, that opens a, sh you know, a very large, <laughs> A very large amount of techniques called set reconciliation. This is like the family of techniques. There is um, a set reconciliation where you have two sets of elements and, and you use those techniques to make sure they are the same. Uh, those can be very efficient, but work with set, not with other stuff, right? So, and it allows full parallel uh, validation, which is a problem right now because if you have one step that is serial in your process, there is really nothing you can do to make it faster. And that's, that's a huge issue. There is like, you cannot throw more hardware at it to make it faster. You cannot do anything because you're gonna do the operation one after another. And so even though it doesn't reduce the number of operations you need to do because everything can be done in parallel, if there is too much of it, you can throw more hardware at it, which is, you know, great. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, we're gonna re-enable a few opcodes. A lot of people have talked about that, so I'm gonna go quickly. In May, we have, you know, very basic operation that come. In November, at least that I seek verify, maybe some other stuff. Um, so that's gonna increase the, the smart contract capability. All right, so I'm Amory Sechet. I'm Diddle Nix like that online everywhere. I'm the lead there for Bitcoin ABC. And uh, if people have some question, this is right now. <laughs> I had heard that um, a lot of people don't know what ABC actually stands for in Bitcoin ABC or uh, in the wallet, and I was just hoping you would tell everyone what that stands for. Okay, so originally it was uh, adjustable block size cap because it was a client on which you can select what is the block size cap. Um, it was never intended, actually it was never intended to be like the lead implementation of some fork of Bitcoin. This is uh, more or less what happened. Uh, but um, at the beginning, it was a project of mine to do experimentation and to do research. And when this whole fork started to profile itself, I was a bit worried that it would not happen because it, the, the process was going quite slowly. And so I was worried that there wouldn't be code ready to run the fork soon enough. So I took Bitcoin ABC on which I was doing my experimentation. I scrapped all the experimentation on it and I implemented uh, what is known at Bitcoin Cash now uh, instead, of the, instead of the various experiment I had in there. And then, yeah, this is, this is what it becomes. So is it true that you uh, actually made it possible that the Bitcoin uh, fork, uh, Bitcoin Cash fork existed because of your code and other miners followed the code and created the hard fork that became Bitcoin Cash. Well, it's not just me, right? Like there is uh, various people, I'd say, so as far as the Node software become, this was the first one we was ready and because we had some code ready, it was easier to sell it. But there are other people, I think, uh, John Alfugbol created the first SPV wallet, so to make sure we had an SPV wallet working at launch. Uh, Hai Po Yang created a future market for it and started mining it very early on. There is just like a ton of, a ton of different people that make that happen. It's not just a, a one mind job. Did you all together uh, know each other and uh, like talk 
and uh, like do it together? Yeah, so there was, there was a lot of coding involved, but there was a lot of talking involved as well, trying to go to everybody we could get in touch with and you know, convince them that this is gonna work. Uh, having the code and having a future market were probably the two main stuff that um, you know, helped the most in those kind of negotiation, because now you have a working software and you have, uh, you have a price on the coin, so you see that you have demand for it. Did you know that Bitmain would uh, support the chain? that you created? Well, they made an announcement. So what happened is that a lot of people were still betting on SegWit 2X at the time, but I was highly suspicious that it would not, um, it would not work the way people are intended, but people like, uh, so Bitcoin.com and uh, you know, Bitmain and all those companies, most of them, they were mostly betting on SegWit 2X and they were saying that as a, you know, backup plan, but essentially the backup plan become the main plan. So, you know, like um, Roger Verge and who with Bitmain and Bitcoin.com and various other company, uh, when SegWit 2X did not work, they just like, you know, switch focus. BitPay also switch focus at this time. Like a lot of company were like, you know what, um, this Bitcoin core stuff, is, it's not why we get into the space to begin with. So we're gonna support that. I want to ask you about the uh, RBF. I'm sure there was a reason that the uh, core people implemented it. Yes. And, and I don't know actually why they did it. It seemed from this point of view, it looks like it was a really stupid idea, but I'm sure they had a reason. I wonder what those reasons are and how Bitcoin Cash is, is kind of dealing with Okay, so uh, the reason is because block were full, essentially, they implemented that. So what happened when block are full is that people start wood bidding each other more and more by paying higher and higher fee to get into the block, right? And so what happened then is that it becomes in the interest of the miner to pick the transaction that have the highest fee and not the first one they sell. And so that would create a situation where a uh, miner would you know, start to create blocks that are not quite uh, the way other people in the network expect them to be, so all kind of fast relay protocol would not work as well. Uh, you also find people that have their transactions stuck for several days waiting to expire before they can send a new one. You know, so um, when blocks are full and you don't have technology like RBF, you have all kind of problem. And the way they choose to work around those problems are by, is by creating RBF. But RBF is, I think, a bad solution because it destroys zero confirmation. So the way we're dealing with that is just by having bigger blocks. And so we don't have the problem that RBF is solving to begin with. Uh, Amari, quick one, I'm sorry. Uh, we have some extra time. Do you feel okay to walk through those last few slides we may have skipped? Um, I know that I think there were two slides. Yeah, well, I went quickly through them, but yeah, um, yeah so transaction already, I don't know, like this one, uh, I won't spend too much time on it. Like Anthony did a full talk about that, so. Um, but maybe talk about the opcodes a bit more. So. In the early days of Bitcoin, it's kind of funny because it's not even described in the white paper, but the first version of Bitcoin shipped with a script language to make smart contracts. But it turns out that in the initial version, there were some bugs in the way it was implemented. Some of them led to security flaws, and as a result, it was decided very early on by the developer to disable a bunch of those opcodes to make sure the system is secure. Um, and then later on, because there was this idea that we can never do a hard fork, then it's not possible to add them back. <laughs> uh, because we don't have this constraint for Bitcoin Cash, we actually embrace a uh, hard fork once in a while. Maybe not every day, but um, <laughs> uh, once in a while it's good to have them. Then that allowed us to uh, work on re enabling those all of code that were disabled. And so. You know, like if, if, if some of you are familiar with programming language, you're gonna notice that those operations are actually uh, very basic operation that you would expect from pretty much any script language. Right, and or like being able to do division, I mean like those kind of stuff is not, um, this is not incredible. Um, this is like what you'd expect of a well-formed scripting language. So this one, um, this set of operation is gonna go uh, gonna go live in May. 
Um, in November, we don't have like a definite spec of what's going on in November, but I think at least one of the elements that everybody wants to see in is uh, op data seek verify. Uh, Andrew talked about it, but I'm, I'm gonna like sum up quickly. This is, this is a way to verify a signature on arbitrary data within the script language. And that means that any authority can publish some data and sign them. Maybe, you know, like stock, stock price or, you know, news, who is elected, whatever, you know, like whatever information from the real world. Some, uh, you know, if I want to make a contract with someone, we choose some authority that we both trust that is going to decide and sign. And then we can make a sign, uh, smart contract based on what, um, what the result. So say we want to bet on who is going to be president uh, of the U.S. after Donald Trump, right? We're going to have two candidates. We can contract with, you know, some news organization or whoever. I guess it's not going to be very difficult to find someone that knows who the president is. Um, and that person, at, at the end of the election process, is going to sign a message saying, okay, this is candidate one or candidate two that is elected. Sign the process, and then we can make a smart contract ahead of time. Well, if it's candidate one, I get the money. If it's candidate two, then you get the money. Um, well, it's a bit of a toy example, but you can do very interesting stuff with that. So, um, so yeah, that's certainly going in, and, and certainly more. Um, certainly more is going to go in, but you know, it's not quite. Uh, it's not quite like everything is not quite nailed on. It's like you know, it's nine months. It's forever in the cryptocurrency space. So a lot, a lot can happen in nine months. Like nine months ago, there was no Bitcoin Cash. Uh, that gives you an idea of how far away this is. Okay, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's what I had. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, hi. I was wondering if you could comment on the technical debt in the node and do you feel that it's slowing down some of the new initiatives? And if so, um, yeah, what kind of plans you have to address the, some of the debt in the client? Yeah, um, yeah, so the code style, the code style of the client is uh, not quite uh, up to par with modern standards in terms of coding, I'd say. Um, you know, all the teams working on that, and that's true of core as well, but we're doing it as well. We're just like refactoring various pieces of it to make them better, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to take some time, and it certainly slowed down um, some of the stuff we do. Like, it makes... It makes doing stuff uh, more complicated. Also, you get to realize that this is a kind of software, uh, a lot of part in that software we cannot patch. Right? So if you, you know, if you build an app for the phone and there is a bug in it, then you push the next version and it's all good. If you push an opcode and there is a bug in it, there are going to be smart contracts on chain that you can never touch. Uh, cryptographically secure, you know, this is what the blockchain is for. <laughs> and so you can never fix the opcode without destroying people's money, which they are never going to accept, so you can never do it, right? That means that first we're working with scrappy code and we have this contract, that means that everything that is opcode related actually moves uh, much slower than what you would expect, say, if you were programming, uh, uh, um, you know, some script executor for something else. Right, it, like the bars needs to be significantly higher on that one. Thank you, Amory. Yep. Core developer, Bitcoin ABC. Thank you.